In this roundup of the week, panic provokes lockdowns and quarantines in Europe, even though almost nobody's dying. Panic leads to a U-turn in the UK's position on fantasy exam results, so now there are prizes for everyone. And panic underpins the start of the US presidential elections. Don't panic, my name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the hysterical panic attack. That is 2020. Breathe. I hope you're well. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere or in the South of the US, dodging the virus. And I put it that way because as time has passed, it has become increasingly clear that in spite of the panic measures by certain governments, there is no second wave of coronavirus in Europe. Why do I say that? Because the apparent resurgence in cases is not turning into admissions in ICU, is not turning into deaths. It's absolutely right that you should hold off coming to such conclusions for a certain period of time, since you never know if a resurgence might have more delay built in between cases and deaths than there were before. But it's been long enough now that it should have started to happen, at least in the earliest countries to show a resurgence. Here's a rather powerful visual illustration of a point from Spain. And I've taken the idea for this visual from Ivor Cummins. The top of the graph is cases. The bottom is the inverted curve for deaths. And there you see the initial spike as we went into the pandemic, big surge in cases, and then slightly later, the equivalent spike, sadly, in deaths as a result. But then you look at the apparent new surge in cases, the one that's prompted the UK government to impose quarantines and hence devastate people's travel to Spain. And there's nothing. Not a smaller curve. Not a later curve. And it's the same position for France, which has recently been added to the UK's quarantine zone. Belgium got hit hard first time around with the highest deaths per capita in Europe. It has a big chunk of new cases. Nothing on the deaths curve. Germany has a minor drift upwards on cases, enough to get the government worried. Nothing on the deaths curve. The UK has seen a slight drifting upwards. Deaths, no movement upwards at all. The Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine says that the apparent increase mostly arises from an increase in testing in the community, which has risen by 82% from 43,161 on the 1st of July to 78,522 on the 31st. If you standardise results per 100,000 tests, then you can see a downward curve in cases in hospitals and a flat line for cases in the community. Now, this doesn't mean that the pandemic is over worldwide, obviously. In the Southern Hemisphere, where it's currently winter, the spikes are real and the deaths are real as well. South American cases and deaths have largely plateaued, but have yet to begin their fall. Australia's absolute numbers may still be relatively small, but the deaths have come with it, so the lower that spike can be kept, the fewer deaths there will be. Whether that wholly justifies the arguably authoritarian steps being taken in places like Melbourne, that's another question. Indeed, not only have a thousand extra police been mobilised to check people are conforming to tight restrictions, but they're now unleashing an army of drones to scan for infractions as well. Drones are being deployed in Perth as more activities are banned. They're the eyes and voices in the sky. Social distancing is critical. And the situation is more complex in the US for reasons that are not entirely obvious. The more northerly states, and particularly those that were hit hard the first time round, such as New York and New Jersey, are not seeing any sort of resurgence, just the same as with Europe. The southern states are seeing figures broadly in line with the southern hemisphere plateaued, starting to drift a little downwards. It's not quite as neat and tidy as that implies, though, so you have to look at it on a state-by-state -state basis. But there's no sign that any states that have been affected by COVID are doing anything but following the same curve experienced by everybody else that has been hit by the pandemic. There is no policy response that seems to result in a runaway crisis, where the numbers of cases just continue to go up and up exponentially. At the end of all that, you might be wondering, how come our governments have been getting it so wrong? Why, for instance, has the UK government been lurching from one panic measure to the next, slamming in a quarantine against travel to Spain and then to Belgium and then to France? 
Why are they suddenly imposing rules about wearing masks now, well after the point when there's actually a pandemic, with some locations using messages like don't kill granny to shame people into line? My theory is that it's all a consequence of those people who have been hammering the government and telling it that if it had acted one week sooner, thousands fewer people would have died. When you keep getting told by the BBC, by Piers Morgan, by even some of the epidemiologists who were advising you at the time, when all of those people are saying, if you'd moved one week quicker, then all these lives would have been saved. Well, it's not surprising, is it? De facto, the government has been trained to panic at the first sign of trouble. It has become the Pavlov's dog of coronavirus. And not just the UK, but governments across Europe, barring Sweden. France is leading the charge for government-level bedwetting. Nicolas Peju, the deputy head of the regional health agency, said that a rising number of cases confirmed that the virus was active again in Paris. He told Le Monde, What is certain is that the trend has clearly reversed and the epidemic has restarted. The country's health minister, Olivier Verin, at the weekend said that the number of deaths and intensive care cases had begun rising only in the last two days, reflecting the fact that most new infections were among people who were under 40. France reported 3,310 new cases on Saturday, but only 29 new hospital admissions and nine ICU patients. In no universe is just nine ICU patients indicative of a trend. I mean, don't get me wrong, the situation should be monitored carefully and any real evidence of serious changes should be taken duly seriously. But France is now tightening some restrictions, making the wearing of masks compulsory at work, for instance, all based on the number of cases fed by increased testing. There's every indication right now that this is following a seasonal pattern. But rather than looking at this and behaving accordingly, we're pretending that any second this thing's just going to go surging forward like it did originally, even though that's not happened anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. Whatever were the merits or demerits of the early actions, there is significant evidence that continuing restrictions well into the recovery phase is going to do more harm than good. A UK government report issued by the Department of Health and Social Care said that the impact of the lockdown and the recession that follows it is going to cause a greater loss of quality of life than the disease itself. It talks in terms of qualies, or collies, quality adjusted life years, which is equivalent to one year in perfect health. Coronavirus is expected to result in the loss of 570,000 collies in the UK, but the long-term legacy of the lockdown will lead to the loss of 812,000 collies because the deaths caused by heart disease, mental health issues, musculoskeletal disorders. However, this doesn't mean that lockdown is meant to cause actual more deaths. The number of excess deaths from COVID-19 is estimated to be 42,000, compared with 33,000 that is estimated to have been caused by the lockdown and recession. The report then goes on to estimate that if there had been no lockdown, the death toll would have been 504,000 from COVID-19. Really? I mean, really? You're still quoting the Neil Ferguson figures. Let's be clear, there have been 770,000 deaths in the entire world so far. Sweden did very little lockdown and their deaths per million were in a similar range to ours in the UK, but slightly less. Every country in the Northern Hemisphere that got hit by this followed a similar curve. On what grounds can you possibly sustain a continued belief in those fantasy figures? Toby Young of the Lockdown Skeptic site quotes a professor, Gordon Hughes, making an extremely good point about the epidemiological input into this crisis. At the outset, COVID-19 was treated as an area for specialist epidemiologists. But it has become clear that there is a whole group of competent data analysts who have provided new information and better analysis that goes way beyond the stuff produced by the insiders. In part, it reflects the fact that epidemiology doesn't use methods or data that go significantly beyond what economists, statisticians, etc. are used to. There is, for example, nothing in the pandemic models of Ferguson et al. that is really different from economic models that I and others have used in the past, while their statistical skills appear to be limited, to put it politely.
The message about other consequences was also highlighted this week by doctors in Denver who were trying to answer the puzzle of why heart attacks had apparently declined even as COVID-19 struck. And that's not just in Denver, it's a phenomenon that's been witnessed across the world. The answer was, unsurprisingly, that they didn't decline at all. People were having heart attacks and dying, but at home. Looking at data on ambulance calls in Denver, they found that while overall calls for service went down during the stay-at-home period, the number of people dying from cardiac arrests at home more than doubled. Indeed, in the two weeks following the imposition of lockdown, that number was greater than the total number of people who died from COVID-19 in the same time period, which is seen as relevant to the question of why there have been higher excess deaths than just those that you could attribute to the virus. It's statistical confirmation of what we already knew. People aren't getting the medical help they would normally get. And the upshot of all of this is that it remains too early to be jumping to conclusions about which countries have done well and which countries haven't. That's a point I've been making here over and over and over. It may be that those who lock down earliest and hardest turn out to have been less clever than have might have been thought. Or it might be that those actions were absolutely the best thing to do. These are things that will only be known with perfect 2020 hindsight. Sadly, that doesn't stop junk research following an ideological agenda. There are numerous different flavours of such junk research, but for instance, this week, there was this one. A new piece of research has been produced to show that countries led by women have responded better to the pandemic than countries led by men. Why is it junk research? Let me count the ways. First, yes, it's too early. I refer you to the comments I was just making. The researchers do admit that the costs of lockdown have yet to be realised. They acknowledge that, but the report was still launched with an article headed Female-Led Countries, COVID-19 Outcomes Systematically and Significantly Better. As you would expect, the press stories have reported the message, not so much the caveats. Second, even if the information was correct in its own terms, it gives you nothing you can practically use. The next pandemic comes along. What does the research say we should do in order to have better outcomes this time? It says, be a woman. Well, that's really helpful. Non-junk research would have looked at the full sample of 194 countries and asked which country characteristics correlate to short-term better or worse outcomes, and then which country policy responses correlate to short-term better or worse outcomes, what evidence do they provide together as to the policy approaches that may make some significant difference, if any, which would then at least enable you, as the costs of lockdown begin to be felt, to compare those benefits against the costs. But no. Do you have a cervix? That's as good as we're going to get. That old virus takes one look at that cervix in charge and it goes weak at the knees. And third, the methodology is unsurprisingly suspect. If you're framing your research around an ideological agenda, it's always going to be a point of interest as to how you got to your results. doesn't mean that ideologues can never come up with useful research, because those with the motivation to look for something will often be the ones to find it, even if it is actually there. But they're also the ones likely to adopt the methodology that makes those outcomes more likely. Now, there's a lot we can't tell on this one because the paper doesn't include the data. They do tell you that in order to come to their conclusion, they formed comparison pairs, neighbour countries, where they found countries with a similar population size, GDP, and a couple of other factors to try to get close circumstances for the comparison. They don't even list the pairs in the paper, although the article that launched for research mentions four of them. New Zealand, female, paired with Ireland, male. Germany, female, paired with the UK, male. Serbia, female, with Israel, male. And Bangladesh, female, with Pakistan, male. That strikes me as some odd pairings. I guess with New Zealand and Ireland, you can point to the fact that New Zealand has a 4.8 million population and Ireland has a 4.9 million population. But other than that, they're pretty different. One is Southern Hemisphere, one is Northern, which makes points of comparison on COVID-19 somewhat tricky, given that, like a seasonal flu, they're following different trajectories. 
One is an island separated by a significant difference from everywhere else. One is attached to the UK and has many of the European headquarters of multiple corporations based there. Are we quite sure that if you put Jacinda Ardern, who is no doubt a very capable leader, if you put her in charge of Ireland, are we quite sure the outcomes would have been that different? Let's suppose you looked at a more obvious comparison. Another island. Southern Hemisphere. The sizes are quite different, but let's compare with Australia, led by a man. The research was submitted on 3rd of June, so let's go from the 2nd of June. At that point, Australia had had 101 deaths and New Zealand 22. Australia has approximately six times the population of its smaller neighbour, so if you looked at the deaths per population figures on that basis, Australia was slightly ahead of on its initial responses from New Zealand. Even without the help of a powerful in-charge owner of a cervix. Obviously, since the research was published, both countries have had renewed surges. Hopefully both of them will squash those flats soon. Shall we just wish them both well that they see the best outcome, regardless of who's in charge? Germany was paired with the UK. Germany has an 83 million population and the UK has a 66 million. That's quite a gap. If population correlation was enough to twin New Zealand with Ireland, you'd at least think you'd twin Germany with the other European country closest to it, which at 84 million would be Turkey, led by a man. Turkey only had 6,039 deaths from COVID-19 compared to Germany's 9,314. You get the general point. 194 countries, 19 of them led by women. It's relatively easy to come up with a justification for comparisons that will give you the result you want. With a few equally plausible alternative definitions, you might have ended up with the complete opposite. What about the worst countries? Since around 10% of countries are led by women, if there was no particular impact, then you'd expect one of those to make it into the worst top 10. If you order countries by the worst deaths per million descending, the top of the list is Belgium, led by a woman with 860 deaths per million population. Funnily enough, we're not told by the research authors who they paired Belgium with. Not so interesting, apparently. So we've trawled through statistics on COVID-19 quite a few times on this channel for various reasons. I think I can safely say that this is the only time we've done so and achieved zero insight of any use to anybody. How you could decide to do all that comparison work and direct it to the conclusion of yay women rather than these are the policies that suppressed early deaths. I'm not entirely sure. But that is the research that was making headlines this week. Obviously, the important news from that research came too late for the US presidential election. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were officially launched this week with an online-only event that saw former presidents breaking tradition by ripping into one of their successors. So that's probably the end of that tradition, because who's not going to do the same now? And of course, we had Joe Biden himself making his acceptance speech for the nomination. And by and large, his speech was well delivered and well received. You can't help but think there was some triumphing over low expectations that may have played into that, because after Republicans have been playing over and over again various blooper reels implying that he can't string a sentence together, it's a pretty effective riposte. Of course, those Republicans would point out, and correctly so, that this is the difference between live, off-the-cuff events and scripted ones. And that's true. If his campaign could organise that all his campaigns would be done this way and there were no live interviews and no debates, I expect they'd be pretty happy about that. But it's hard to see that that will be achievable. However, the speech stood out for one main reason which was the shift into the rhetoric of light versus darkness. Here's what that sounded like. The current president has cloaked American darkness for much too long. Too much anger, too much fear, too much division. Here and now, I give you my word. If you entrust me with the presidency, I will draw on the best of us, not the worst. I'll be an ally of the light, not the darkness. It's time for us, for we the people, to come together and make no mistake. United, we can and will overcome 
this season of darkness in America. That's a remarkable formal recognition out loud for the Democrats' basic position for this election. It's not about policy. It's not about competence. It's about good versus evil. Now, that got your attention, which I suppose is what you're trying to do if you're launching the final phase of your campaign. Personally, I'm not convinced it was a smart play. What's the task here if you're the Democrats? Surely to win back the people who voted for Barack Obama, who subsequently voted for Donald Trump. What are you saying to those people? That they voted for evil? You think that's a persuasive proposition to put to them? Even the ones who since felt that they made a mistake. They probably don't think like that. Democrats activists think that, of course. Democrats activists went into 2016 election telling people that Trump would be literally Hitler. Over and over the memes went out, literally Hitler. The voters didn't believe it then and the only thing that's changed is that we've now had four years of Trump not being Hitler. Now you may be like John Bolton and think that he's erratic and incompetent. You may be like Ben Shapiro and say, think that he says too much dumb stuff. You may be concerned about COVID-19 and feeling that he fluffed that crisis, but unless you've got an ideological filter firmly in place, you won't have seen him be like Hitler or be evil. So if Joe Biden's campaign pitch is vote for me, I'm not Trump, does it make sense from that positioning to describe Trump in terms that people outside your own base don't recognise? Or would it be more effective to focus on the things that they do recognise? This is why Democrats could still lose this election, whatever the polls currently say. Panic in the face of Trump and the prospect of him repeating his upset of 2016 is leading them to follow a suboptimal strategy. Of course, the speeches of the conventions are just the start and the Republicans will no doubt have some perfectly fine ones as well. The majority of voters won't watch any of them. It comes down to what happens in the campaigns. Both campaigns need better strategy and conviction that will hold firm even when under attack from the other side. And that actually seems not a bad lead into another subject. Last week I was talking about the UK's muddle over the A-level exam results. The UK cancelled the exams, which was the big mistake. Difficult though it would have been logistically to go ahead with them. It then got teachers to grade the pupils based on their expectation, which was a big mistake because it's a system with a built-in incentive for over-generous assessment. It then tried to deal with those inevitable consequences by applying an algorithm to knock the results to the sort of shape they typically would have been. And that was by then perhaps the least worst option. But given the timescale involved and the unprecedented circumstances of COVID, etc, etc, it was always going to throw up a high percentage of unfair outcomes. So that was why they had an appeals process, which is fine. But timings were tight and so there was lots of stress. The Scottish government had already caved to emotional pressure, doing an embarrassing U-turn and going with the teacher's assessment after all. And that was when I did last week's video, in which I said this. In the rest of the UK, they aim to hold the line a bit more robustly. Government? Robust? I mean, OK, I said a bit more robust, but this was more robust in the way that wet lettuce is more robust than a soggy sandwich. Because in a couple of days of suggesting there would be no U-turns, yep, there was a U-turn. On almost every level, this was a mistake. Before we go into why, let's pull out the learning point from this. Because at every stage, this process has been in the hands of well-intentioned people making what they thought were the right decisions. But the key mistakes here were twofold. The first was not identifying that initial decision whether or not to go ahead with exams was one that triggered a set of descending consequences. With those sorts of decisions, you have to be the chess player who is playing three or four moves ahead of the game, not just the move immediately in front of you. Exams were cancelled around the 20th of March and it was established that the exams body, Ofqual, would work with various bodies to develop a standardising approach that would be applied. In other words, it hadn't worked out what to do. It just believed that it was a problem that could be solved relatively easily. Well, the truth is it was probably no more complicated than it would have been to work with various bodies to establish how the exams could go ahead. The barrier to that option was probably measured in panic and a failure to evaluate pros and cons in the face of criticism. 
The second mistake was then having tipped over the first domino not to hold the line and take the consequences with a second. If you'd planned for the hard cases, knowing that the news media would seek out the worst ones to highlight, and you had your system in place to quickly deal with those worst ones, then you would at least have been able to project some confidence in a system that is 80% right and flexible enough to cope with the other failures. The U-turn achieves the worst of all worlds. There is more unfairness, not less, even though some of it will be invisible. Plus, you look thoroughly incompetent and out of control, which has other important consequences as well in the middle of a pandemic. There's one level of unfairness which I pointed out last week, that the high-performing teenagers are suddenly having to compete for places with people who, under normal circumstances, would not have been eligible. The ones that wouldn't have been qualified will have a higher likelihood now of failure as they take courses that may be beyond them. We've seen that whenever universities lower the bar for entry in the name, for instance, of diversity, they get higher dropouts and failures because the people they let in can't cope with the standards and the work ethic required by that level of course. But the real losers in all of this are next year's students. Most universities offer more places than they expect to have to honour because they know that a reliable percentage of the students won't achieve the entry requirement with their exams. But this year, most of them have, thanks to the generosity of their teachers and the panic of everyone else. Most of the universities will honour their offers. Oxford, for instance, one of the elite, absolute top universities, has said that it will do so. They will have to cram more than usual in, probably resulting in a less good teaching experience. Maybe you could do it if you could squeeze them in like intensively reared chickens, but there will be social distancing requirements. Most will also therefore have to encourage some of the students to take their places in 2021, take a gap year. Indeed, the government called on universities to specifically push the middle classes back to next year, favouring the less well-off students this year. So next year's exam takers will be competing for fewer places than would ordinarily be available. And nobody will be writing thundering headlines about their dilemma. And there might be even fewer places than that, since the less good universities may go under this year. If all the students get their first place choices, fewer get forced into their second or third or fourth place choices. So the top universities are crammed, the lower ones go bust. Which then means that those places may disappear forever. Even before Covid, according to the Higher Education Statistical Agency, 119 out of 194 universities were in deficit. And that was even with lots of international students who pay massively more, and not so many of them coming this year. The Institute of Fiscal Studies calculates there'd be £11 billion loss of income to the university sector in the long run, which would see around 13 universities become financially unviable. So in summary, good students this year get penalised with competition for places for less able students and a poorer teaching experience. The less good students get penalised by being given places beyond their ability and so more likely to lead to failure. And the good students of next year get penalised by being required to meet a higher standard in order to get diminishing number of places. None of that was made inevitable by a virus. It was made inevitable by how bureaucracies make decisions and how they and the public fail to deal with statistical evaluation of risk. Now, maybe it wouldn't have been a bad thing if there were a few fewer university places. I mean, it's a valid question, but you probably don't want it to be answered by a ramshackle game of consequences from the coronavirus. If you liked this video, why not give it a boost by sharing it on your favourite social media platform? Let's see if we can push the subscriber count on this channel across that 10k threshold this week. This week I also published a video looking in detail at what we've learned in the couple of weeks since the explosion in Beirut. That video was one that couldn't be monetized because it deals with real life disaster and dark events. So thanks once again to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Your support enables me to make the videos on the topics that matter regardless of whether YouTube advertisers will be happy with them or not. If you want to join the wonderful people who already support the independent, fact-focused, non-ideological content that I aim to provide on this channel, please go to patreon.com forward slash Baker.
And finally, you might also be interested to know I was interviewed this week by Ross Trevina for his podcast, The Ross Trevina Project. It was a great discussion and I think you'll find it an interesting listen. There's a link to that in the video description below. That's all for now. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.